Hi, I'm Clay with Sharing the Good News here at ClayGentry.com. I have here with me today my very good friend, Edwin Crozier. Edwin is uh, living in Brownsburg, Indiana. Happened to be passing through Middle Tennessee today, and so I snagged him to come in and do a video interview with us, primarily focusing on the topic of grace. Edwin's done a lot of writing uh, of late on this topic. Uh, he's written a Bible class book, a sermon series. I think it was an eight-part sermon series. Several blog posts at edwincrozier.com. And so I just asked if he could come in and sit down with us and help us understand better uh, God's grace uh, that we have through His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for coming, Edwin. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. All right, let's start out with a, with kind of a softball question. Okay. What is grace? <laughs> All right. <laughs> my, my one sentence answer, Okay. what is grace? Grace is God's power to overcome sin. Okay. God's grace is... Is God's power to overcome, overcome sin. All right, now that's different than how I heard it defined growing up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, growing up, I always heard it defined as uh, God's unmerited favor to right. us. Yeah. Why, are, why do you define it that way instead of just the traditional way we've kind of always heard it? Sure. Unmerited favor is clearly a part of the technical definition of grace. Uh, grace is something that is given, that is not earned, that is not deserved. And so we've commonly heard unmerited favor. The mm -hmm. reason why I choose to define it just a little bit differently is to get more at the heart of what the Bible is telling us about God's grace that actually justifies us. Let me give you an illustration. There's the word baptism. Okay. There's the technical definition for the word baptism, which is simply immerse. Right, right. If I just want to use the technical definition, immerse, I'm not really getting at what the Bible is talking about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 when it says to be baptized for the remission of sins. If I want to talk about Bible baptism, I have to give more than just the technical definition of the word. Okay. And so grace certainly can be defined as God's unmerited favor. But when we're talking about grace as it is applied to us, mm -hmm. his children who are longing to be with him forever, what we need to understand is that grace is his power to overcome sin. I also define it that way to kind of tacitly explain what grace is not. Okay. Grace is not God's permission to sin. All right. And I fear that there are a whole lot of people that have uh, implicitly defined grace. Even though they mm -hmm. use technical terms, they've implicitly defined it as God just overlooking our sins. Okay. And I want to demonstrate that that's not grace at all. When we believe that grace is God overlooking, ignoring, or even permitting sin, then we're going to abuse it and misuse it and, and not obey God as we should. But grace is God's power to overcome sin so mm -hmm. that we can obey Him. Okay. Now, you, you've hit on several different things there. Uh, primarily one word that I heard you repeat several times is the word sin. Okay. Okay. Why do we need God's grace? Is it simply just to overcome sin? Is that its whole function, its whole uh, process in the life of a Christian to kind of fill in what we have not been able to do? That's going to depend on what you mean by is it simply that. I think in one way I'd say, yeah, that's what it is. It's God's power to overcome sin, and that encompasses everything that is about grace unless you mean something different than I mean. The, the reason why uh, I'm going to say that it's we need grace, buddy. yeah, <laughs> Romans chapter 7 is the heart for me of why we need God's grace. In Romans chapter 7, this is a lengthy reading, but in Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 7, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Paul personifies sin okay. as an acting agent, as if it's a person that is doing something in our lives. And so I recognize that's a figure of speech here. But as he personifies sin, he points out that sin did a couple of things. First of all, it distorted God's law. Okay. Through that distortion, it has deceived me. Mm -hmm. And then because I've been deceived, it has destroyed me. Okay. I have died because of that. I need something to overcome that. 
And if, it, if that's all it was, I would still need God's grace. But Paul goes on to point out that it's done one more thing. It's deceived us. It's, it distorted God's law. It deceived us. It's destroyed us. Now keep reading in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law. When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of, that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Sin distorted God's law, deceived us, destroyed us, and now it's dominating us. Okay. I need something that's going to help me overcome that domination. Something to break that power? Something to break that power. Back in Romans chapter 6, it had pointed out that uh, in verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. At some point in my life, I decided to sin. I do believe that was my choice. I don't believe I was predestined to do that. I don't believe I was born in such a way that I had to do that. I believe that was my choice. Mm -hmm. I chose to do that. But once I gave sin an inch, it took a light year. And sin is not willing to just destroy me. It wants to dominate my life. Okay. Grace is what God does so that that power is broken. It brings life back because sin killed me, mm -hmm. but it also brings power back. It is the power to overcome sin. Now, I don't know what all questions exactly you're going to be asking me. I want to make sure that I make this point right now, and I hope I'm not covering something that's supposed to come up later. A lot of fear around grace. A lot of fear that when we start talking about God's grace, we're going to give people permission to sin. And the reason there's that fear is because there's a lot of people that use it that way. A lot of people use grace as God's permission to sin. Oh, grace will cover that. Grace will take care of that. I don't have to worry about that. Oh, we don't have to talk about that. We're under grace. That is not the point at all. When I was studying this, I just had some real struggles because I, I saw passages that you know, talk about grace saving us and other passages that talk about uh, faith and, and the works of faith. And, and, and I tried to figure out how does all that go together. And I looked at Romans 8.1 where it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm thinking, does that mean I can just do what I want because I'm in Christ Jesus? I'm not going to be condemned? But Romans 7 helped me with that because I looked at Paul mm -hmm. and I noticed what Paul said. When he was sinning, he was doing what he did not want. What he wanted to do was obey God. What I learned from this is that grace is not for people looking for permission to sin. Grace is not for people who want to figure out how much sinning they can do. Grace is for people who want to obey God. If someone's looking for permission to sin, if someone's trying to figure out how they don't have to figure out what God's Word said because it's all under grace, grace is not for them. Mm -hmm. Grace is for those who, like Paul in this passage, want to do what's right, but have figured out that because of the sin they've allowed in their lives, they no longer have the power to do it. And so they have to turn their lives over to Jesus, and His grace is the power to overcome sin, which is why in verse 25, Paul had asked this question in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? There was an answer, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. So if I come back then to the original question, the second question we did, why do we need God's grace? Mm -hmm. it, it's really, why do those who want to serve God need His grace? B because it, it's not for people who want to live a life of sin. Right. Well, Unless they want to turn the life over to God. It, it, am I understanding that? I, I guess I could say yes and no. No in the sense that everyone needs God's grace. Everyone Let me try this. Everyone needs God's grace. Got it. Everyone needs that. Otherwise, they are going to be lost. They mm -hmm. are going to be lost in their sins. They're going to die because of their sins, and they're going to die eternally because of their sins. Grace is offered to all people. Okay. But the point of grace is to give us the power to overcome sin, not, not to give us the permission to just linger in our sins. Okay. Those who want to obey God are the ones who really figure out how much they need it. 
because they're the ones that have been hitting their head against that wall like Paul had done, <clears throat> saying, I want to, I want to, I want to, but I keep messing up. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that realize, oh, I need something outside of me. I need God's power in my life. I need grace. That, that's really kind of the people described then, if I understand you, in the first part of the Beatitudes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those who are poor in spirit. Right. Those who, because of their poverty of spirit, and that poverty of spirit is not just, oh, I need a little nudge. Mm -hmm. Hey, buddy, can you spare a dime? This is, I'm going to die. Left to myself, I'm going to die. I'm at the brink of starvation. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing that I can bring. I need something because I am so poor in spirit. And that poverty of spirit has produced mourning in me. I'm mourning over me. Right. But the reason I can be comforted is because when I come to God in meekness, humbly surrendering to Him, mm -hmm. because I hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right. And that's, that's really interesting because notice it's not hungering and thirsting for heaven. Or permission. Or permission. But I, I want you to know that it's not just hungering and thirsting for heaven because a lot of folks have this idea that what matters is can I get to heaven? Can I get to heaven? Can I go ahead and do this thing over here, but still go to heaven? Well, that's what God's grace is for. I can go ahead and do this and still go to heaven. No, no, no. Well, it's not about hungering for heaven. It's about hungering for righteousness. Okay, define righteousness. Righteousness is being right before God. Okay. Righteousness is doing what is right. Righteousness is being right in God's presence. When I hunger for that, mm -hmm. and I bang my head against the wall of my own unrighteousness, I'm suddenly, that's where I'm going to be mourning... And that's when I realized I just have to surrender to God. God's way works. Mm -hmm. Which so happens to be the title of your blog. Title of my blog, that's right. <laughs> so, God's way works. Okay. So we, we've kind of defined grace. Give us that definition one more time. Grace is God's power to overcome sin. If we can do that second sentence. God's no. power to overcome sin. But it's not His permission. Not permission to, to sin. sin. Okay. Grace is not God's prerogative to overlook sin. It is not God's permission to sin. It is God's willingness. It is not God's willingness to ignore sin. It is God's power to overcome sin. Okay, and, and we all need God's grace. We all need God's grace because we are all sinful we've creatures, all sinned. and we've all sinned. And Romans three twenty three. All okay. sin falls short. God. All right. Now, we need it. Yeah. How do we get it? How do we get it? Romans five two talks about the access to God's grace. Let's start in verse 1, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay. By faith, we gain access to God's grace. Now, that opens up a host of other questions. Maybe you were going to follow up with some. I'll just anticipate it. Does that mean I just have a moment of belief and now I've got God's grace? No. Does that mean I can do what I want as long as I believe in the Lord and I have access to God's grace? No. The picture, I think, that really helps us with this is in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14. Now, this is Peter walking on the water? Peter walking on the water. Oh, okay. How, how is this going to be a picture for us? I'll explain that to you. Do it. <laughs> Jesus is walking on the water. The disciples okay. were afraid, and he says, hey, don't be afraid. It's me. That's verse 27. Verse 27. In mm -hmm. verse 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, notice this, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. It's not a suggestion. It's not a maybe. It's a command. Peter asked for a command. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. The thing I want you to recognize is that he got out of the boat. That was Peter's choice. Peter chose to get out of the boat. Peter was the one who stepped out of the boat. Mm -hmm. Then he walked on the water. Now here's my question for you. When this is done, when Peter has walked on the water, does he get to get back in the boat and say, look at me how awesome I am, I walked on the water? No. No, of course not. Right. He's got to give glory to Jesus. We're seeing the grace of Jesus allowed him to walk on water. It gave him, it empowered him to do what he could not do. When he was walking on that water, it's not Peter. But Peter had to get out of the boat. Mm -hmm. What is it that prompted him to get out of the boat? A command. He was commanded. Right. But if I commanded you to get out of that boat, would you do it? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, because you're Edwin. Because I'm Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus commanded him, and he did. Right. Why? Right. Because, because he's of the Lord. His, because he's the Lord. Because he's faith. Because of his faith. Right. Now, what do we see from this? Faith gave Peter the access to God's grace. It wasn't just, I believe it. 
I believe it enough to actually do what Jesus has said. And so we have in James chapter 2. Okay. Uh, where, where were you expecting well, you me know, to go? Well, you know, I was actually thinking about Hebrews 11. Okay. Uh, by faith, all these people perform these actions in faith. Absolutely. By faith, Abel offered to God yeah. a more acceptable sacrifice. Of course, the one I especially like that I think illustrates this point really well, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith. How did he become an heir of righteousness? Well, because he had faith, he actually built the ark. Mm -hmm. He could believe that God would use the ark all day long. He could believe God that the water is going to come out of the sky and everything's going to flood and, that, and that, that God's ark would save him. But if he didn't actually build the ark, he's going to die. Hmm. And we've also got Abraham in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go hmm. out of that place. Uh, excuse me, I got confused there. He was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Right. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. Abraham could think all these wonderful things about what God would do for him, but if he didn't actually pack his bags and head to the promised land, he wouldn't get any of them. And that really gets us to James 2 that you were going to that gets before us I took to James you on that 2. detour. <laughs> <laughs> that gets us to James 2, where it points out that faith without works is dead. Right. Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Mm -hmm. Someone will say, verse 18, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. There's a larger context here, but the, right. the whole point behind it is the only faith that actually works is, is a faith, faith that actually works. works. Wow. Faith gives us access to God's grace, not because if I have a moment of belief, God's now just going to wipe everything out, but because it's my faith that causes me to say God's way works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say say I offered to you a million dollars and I said, Clay, I'm going to give you a million dollars. That would be nice. You would like that. I would. You would like that. I said, Clay, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but all you have to do is you have to uh, uh, run around Alabama's campus <laughs> wearing an Auburn <laughs> t-shirt yelling War Eagle for mm. 30 minutes. Mm. Now, would you do that when I said, hey, I'll give you a million dollars if you do that? Whew. Yeah, I guess I would do that. What, would you do it if I told you I'll give you a million dollars? That's, that's my <laughs> well, point. Well, that's probably no. I probably Why not? I, I know you better than that's that. You right. don't have a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. Yep. You have no faith that I have a million dollars. Right. Now, if, I don't know, Bill Gates or someone like that signed a contract and said million dollars yeah. for the guy who does this. Yeah. yeah I, he's I have, got it. He's got the million dollars. I think he's going to give it to me. It's your faith that he's <clears> going to keep his promise that causes you to do what he's asked of you. Right which then gains you access to the grace of the million dollars in that case. Okay, bring so that, that back home to spirit. So Romans 5, 2. Faith gives us access to grace. Okay. Why? Because when I believe God, as Hebrews 11 says, those who uh, would come to Him must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those who seek Him. My faith that He is going to reward those who seek Him mm -hmm. causes me to seek Him, and that gives me the access to God's grace. Okay. Um, let me let me build off that for just a minute. There, there's a lot of people out there in the religious world that would say, okay, you, you've got to demonstrate that faith by saying a prayer or asking Jesus to come into your heart. What, what's Kind of wade through that for just a moment, uh, those initial acts of faith, if we can say that. Okay. Certainly, if we're talking about entering into Jesus Christ, how do I go from I'm a lost sinner to now I'm into Jesus Christ? Tying it with faith, Mark chapter 16. Okay. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. I'm repeating it like I'm preaching a sermon yeah, waiting for everybody to... Yeah, that's what I was to, thinking. Sorry about that. <laughs> Jesus said to them, Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Do I believe his promise? Then okay. I'm going to surrender to what he says. I've got to be baptized. I've got to be immersed in water for the remission of my sins. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In fact, ties in with grace very well. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This passage covers a couple of things here. First of all, there is the faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've already established that the only way I'm going to do this is by faith. Okay. But there's also a changed life. What's my purpose in trying to do this? So I can be raised to walk in newness of life. Not so I can be raised to just go on with what I was doing in the past. Right. A lot of folks would call that repentance. Okay. I'm going to repent. I'm making a change. I realize I want to do differently. I, I reckon, well, the only way I can do differently is if Jesus is in my life and I'm in Jesus. And so what do I do here? When we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. We were buried with him in order that we could be raised with him to walk in the newness of life. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, just real quick, I, and I know we're, oh, you're we've got a lot of questions and not much time here, I'm sorry. But Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him mm-hmm. through what? Faith uh-huh. in the powerful working of God mm-hmm. who raised him from the dead. My faith leads me to surrender to Jesus Christ in baptism, that's not my work saving me. Right. What does it say? I'm having the faith in the of working God. of God. Right. It's not, I got baptized, and that shows how great I am at keeping the rule of baptism. Rather, I was baptized because I believe God said He was going to work in that. Right. Just like Jesus said, come on the water, and Peter believed Him mm-hmm. that He would be able to do it, mm-hmm. God has said that He will work when I am baptized. When I'm getting baptized, it's not about my work, it's about His work. Mm -hmm. And it's the fact that I have faith in His working. And so I surrender to Him in baptism, and He saves me. He works in that baptism. So essentially what I heard in all of that is we we come to a faith, and that faith demands actions in order to be a saving faith, if I can use that word. That's how we come into access to God's grace. We're baptized. But something that kind of rung in my ears as you were reading those is this whole idea of being born again. Being a, being a born-again Christian is being born again through the waters, being a new person of baptism. John chapter 3 talks about that, being, okay. being born of water and the Spirit. Okay. Uh, that we will be, not that we're going to enter into the womb again. Right. Yeah, because that's what Nicodemus, that's what Nicodemus thought. Nicodemus thought. Not that we'll enter into the womb again, but having been baptized in water, mm-hmm. there is also a rebirth of the Spirit, a newness of life. Okay as we're surrendering to God. Can, can I take you back to the Matthew 14 example? Or do you want to do something else there? No, uh-uh. Okay, go ahead. thank you. It's my interview. It's your interview. <laughs> I thought you said it was my interview. No, no. <laughs> In the Matthew 14 uh, example, you said something that uh, kind of contradicted my understanding of grace, or at least my understanding or as I was taught growing up. Yeah. But Peter walked, gets out of the boat, he walks on the water, and it was by... Uh, the grace of Christ that he is able to walk on that water. Yeah, absolutely. That's a present tense. Yes. I, I feel like, unless I misunderstood, that when I was being raised up and being taught about God's grace, it was always something in the future that yeah. I had to look forward to it, that, that it would kind of supply that which I was lacking in this mortal life. I heard a teacher or actually I heard of a teacher describing it this way, that she had always viewed God's grace as him grading grading on the curve on Judgment Day. That we're all just doing the best we possibly can by ourselves. Okay. And then on Judgment Day, if we did well enough, he's going to be passing out the the curve. All right. And so those who are in that upper 25% or wherever he decides the line is going to be cut off, get the grace that pushed them over the, the nudge to get the rest of the way. I fear that's a very common idea about grace. I know that's, Mm -hmm. before I started studying really hard a few years ago, that is exactly where I was with grace, that it was something that would happen off in the future. The other other mistake I think I've heard is that God offered His grace on the cross, and now we're doing our best to show, nobody would actually say show that we're worthy of it, but that's almost the way it comes off. He gave His grace on the cross, now we're here all on our own trying to do the best we can to be able to attain and get that sacrifice in the end. Mm -hmm. And so we've got some folks that see grace as something that happened 2,000 years ago, and grace as something that's going to happen on Judgment Day, whenever that is. I see grace, yes, in fact, I try to point out that grace, when we envision grace, we need to see Jesus on the cross. But it's not just this moment in the past or this moment in the future. Grace is something that is in our lives right now. If it's the power to overcome sin, when do I need that power? I need it right now. I need it right now. I'm sinning now, Cause, right? Because I've been <laughs> sinning and I still sin. Not that I'm trying to sin. Hebrews 2 right. helps me out with this. Hebrews chapter 2. 
Since therefore the children share in flesh, this is verse Which 14, verse? by Thank the way. You. Verse yeah, 14. Hebrews 2, 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong sl slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay. When am I tempted? When you're alive? Right now. Right yeah. now? I'm in the tempted present? right now. Okay. He's going to help me right now. You know what I call that? Grace? Grace. Oh. Chapter 4, verse 14. Okay. Hebrews, still Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I think in the past I made a mistake about this passage, thinking that, well, once I've already sinned, now I need some help. I need forgiveness. Now mm -hmm. I'll draw near and be forgiven. Certainly it would apply to that. But when I really need help is when I'm being tempted, as he said back in chapter 2. Okay. When am I in my time of need? When I'm tempted. What can I do? I can draw near to what? The, the throne, throne of grace. Of grace mm -hmm. And I can get help. Another thing, Titus, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The English Standard Version says training us. Some, right. some versions say teaching us. I like the word training, and I think, and I, I'm not a Greek scholar, and you, know, you may get all kinds of comments that I missed it here, but in my study and as I've talked to people, the word for training here is more than what we commonly think of teaching. When, when we think of teaching, it connotes just the idea of passing on information. I can teach you something, mm -hmm. but you may get it or you may, not. you may not. You may walk out understanding it, you may not. Now, of course, I know some people in their definition of teaching would, would disagree with that, but I think most of us have that connotation that someone can teach. That doesn't mean the students got it. Okay. Training, however, if I'm training you, say like we were having on-the-job training, mm -hmm, by the mm -hmm. time I'm done with you, I, I'm having on-the-job training showing you how to dust this table. When I'm done training you, what does that imply you're now able to do? Dust this table. Dust the table. Now, I could teach you to dust the table, and you may, oh, yeah, whatever. But if I have trained you to do it, okay. now you can do it. So one's kind of teaching me just the knowledge. Yeah. The other one's really kind of teaching me the skill. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's the idea of not only the skill, but I got it. I'm doing okay. it. And what I see here is when it says that grace trains us, it's not just saying that grace provides us the information saying we're supposed to do this, but grace trains us. Now, certainly I believe grace trains us through the Word. Mm -hmm. I believe God works through His people. Mm -hmm. he, he, he works through the Word. He works through wise counselors who have been trained by the Word. But grace is not just something that gives us the information saying, do this, don't do that. Grace is God's power to overcome sin. Right. It's the training to get rid of ungodliness and worldly passions and instead to live godly, upright, uh, self-controlled lives. Okay. Wow. So it helps me right now. It it's something that's helping me right now to be more like Jesus Christ. And that's our ultimate goal, right? That, well, that is our ultimate goal. Hi, I'm Clay with Sharing the Good News at ClayGentry.com. Uh, we're back again probably for a part two of this uh, video on grace. Uh, we just got done filming the video and the whole, thing. The whole thing and realized <laughs> that we only actually got 30 minutes of it. And uh, thankfully, though, it ended, don't you think, at Having just spot. the spot. perfect spot because we're quickly about to do a review of what we've covered so far. So let's go ahead and do that uh, for everyone again, and okay. really kind of for our benefit. Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Okay, we've defined grace. Yes. What is the definition? Grace is not God's prerogative to ignore our sins. Mm -hmm. It is not His willingness to overlook our sins, and it is not God's permission to sin. Grace is God's power to overcome sin. Okay, why do we need God's grace? We need God's grace because we're sinners, and when we decided to sin, sin became our master, and the only way to break the sin's control in our lives is by allowing Jesus to have control, and that's what grace is. And so I need to give control over to Him. I need His grace. How do we access it? 
Romans 5, 2, we gain access to God's grace through faith, not because a moment of faith gives me salvation, but because faith is what causes me to get out of the boat. Just like Peter got out of the boat because he believed Jesus. Faith is what causes me to get out of the boat. Getting out of the boat allows me to access the grace to walk on the water, if okay. you will. All right, and then this last question that we technically just did in the video. <laughs> uh, we can have access to God's grace now. It yeah. works for us now. Right. God's grace is not just about what happened on the cross or just what's going to happen at the end. Certainly, I teach that when we picture God's grace, we need to picture Jesus on the cross. And certainly, we know that God's grace is going to be applied to those who are in Jesus at the judgment. Mm -hmm. But from Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4, what we learned at the end of the other video is that Grace is something that helps us right now. We can turn to the throne of grace in our time of need, that time of temptation to get our help to overcome. Okay. Now, I've been raised in, in our faith heritage, if we can use that technical term. Sure. Uh, we put that in quotations. That you know, all, always hear a lot of teaching about losing God's grace, falling away from God's grace. Now, can we lose God's grace? All right. That's a good question. <laughs> My answer is... No. Okay. We cannot lose God's grace. Now, I've been doing some study in Galatians. Sure. I uh, wrote a workbook on Galatians. I'm writing a study book on Galatians to go along with that. Yeah. I know where you're I, about to go. I know Galatians 5.4. Sure. And doesn't that say we can lose God's grace? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4 says this. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by law, you have fallen away from grace. Okay. There you go. Absolutely. The reason why I say no All right. is because of what the word lose connotes for us. Lose has the idea, say, if you lost your pen there, or you lost mm -hmm. your car keys, that this is something that you're trying to keep up with and you're looking for it everywhere and you just can't find it. And it's just something that's beyond you and it didn't really have anything to do with you. Okay. Uh, you I don't believe that can happen with God's grace. So I can't lose God's grace like I did my car keys. You can't the other lose day. God's grace like you did your car keys the other day. Grace is not something that's just here today, gone tomorrow, that, oh, I'm looking for it and now I can't find it. However, you can abandon God's grace. Okay. And that's what's happening here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. They are abandoning God's grace. Now, if all you mean by losing God's grace is that you've fallen from grace, that God's grace is no longer empowering you to overcome sin, is no longer justifying you, yes, I believe that. I just wanted to highlight in a mm -hmm. shocking way that, uh, that we can't just misplace it. There's not some type of heavenly red tape and we fall off the list and just, oh, what happened? Mm -hmm. But if I turn away from trusting in Jesus Christ, I can abandon it. Let me give you a picture. Okay. Peter on the water, Matthew oh, 14. Matthew 14 again. You can tell this one's important to me. My, my marker is already there. <laughs> yeah. Peter accessed God's grace by faith because his faith caused him to obey the command of Jesus stepping out onto the water. Okay. The grace of God was holding him up on the water. It was mm -hmm. by God's grace that he's walking on the water, not by his power, not by his strength, and not just because of his obedience getting out of the boat. Okay. Okay. It's, it's not that his obedience gave him that power. It's that God's grace gave him that power. But as he's walking on the water, he mm -hmm. starts looking around. Mm -hmm. And he sees the wind, the text says, which I believe means he sees the effects of the wind. Okay. Sees the waves, sees the water spraying, sees the boat rocking. And all of a sudden remembers, I can't do this. Mm. I can't walk on water. What on earth am I doing out of the boat? This is crazy. I can't do this. And that faith that he had in Jesus dissipated. Okay. He left it behind. He abandoned the faith that had been allowing him to walk on the water. And so what does he start doing? He starts he sinking. To sink. Okay. What was it that was keeping him on top of the water? God's grace. God's grace. So if he's sinking, what has he left? God's grace. God's grace. Now, it wasn't something that he just lost. It wasn't, uh, oh, oh no, where did it go? It was something he abandoned. It was something he let go. Even Jesus says to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Mm. His faith that faith in Jesus, he left that, okay, and so he sank. When I leave my faith in Jesus, whether it's as Galatians 5.4 is talking about trying to justify myself by my own works, right, or as 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 talks about, 
if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. If I decide to, I'm just not going to do God's way anymore. If I abandon my faith in God's way and my faith is what causes me to work God's way because I believe God's way works, if I abandon that and start going off on my own way again mm -hmm. or turning away from God's way, I've abandoned the faith that gives me access to God's grace. I've abandoned His grace. Okay. And now His grace is no longer giving me the power to overcome. Notice what it says here. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the working of grace in their life. They've escaped the defilements of the world, but they then are again entangled in them and overcome. Right. Grace is God's power for me to overcome sin. Okay. If I decide to go back in sin, and let I'm abandoning overcome. His grace, okay. letting it overcome me. So I can't lose God's grace, not in that sense that we normally think lose, but I can abandon it. Okay. We, we can just turn our backs to it. We can turn our backs to it. And go back out into the world. And we can rebel. You know, one thing, let me make this point. Earlier you said that it's, it's by a conscious decision that we make uh, to come to Christ in faith and, and do those works of faith and have access to His grace. Mm -hmm. But also what I hear too is here that it's also a conscious decision to turn around and abandon that grace. Is that what I'm hearing? It's a conscious decision to come into grace or, or yeah, through to, faith. To gain access through faith. Right. And, and it's also this conscious decision that a person makes to depart from the faith. I guess I'm going to say that depends on what you mean by conscious decision. Conscious decision is because I, you know, obviously if a person makes the conscious decision, I no longer believe in God, I no longer believe in His grace, mm -hmm. I no longer believe in salvation, turns back to the world, turns to atheism or, or turns to Buddhism or something. Okay. That would be a conscious decision. That would be consciously abandoning God's grace. But I think it would also be possible for someone to not necessarily believe they're abandoning God's grace, but because mm -hmm. I think that's why Paul had to write Galatians 5, 4. Okay. Is he's trying to point out to these people, you need to understand what you've done. They didn't make a conscious decision to abandon the grace of God. But through but, their actions. But through their actions, right. that is exactly what they had done. Now, okay. they had made the conscious decision to go back to the old law mm -hmm. in that text, mm -hmm. to go back to trying to save themselves through, through uh, uh, their works of the law. And so, yes, that was a conscious decision. But I guess I want to be real careful. I don't want to leave the impression that I think, unless I have consciously said, I don't care about God's grace. Right. So I think there might be some who deceive themselves into believing, oh, yes, I am pursuing God's grace. Right. Yeah, you know, in fact, that makes me think of Matthew chapter 7. I said that almost like a question. I believe it's Matthew chapter 7. Verse 21, 21 through 23. Mm -hmm. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Right. Here were people that had not made a conscious decision to abandon Jesus completely. They still mm -hmm. called him Lord. Right. But they clearly had made some conscious decisions to pursue lawlessness, to mm -hmm. not actually have their faith in Jesus. They were deceiving themselves. Okay. And I believe we can do that. Okay. So we, if we can deceive ourselves, uh, if we can abandon God's grace, then uh, to kind of use a Peter word, since we've kind of been tossing him, him back and forth, how do we stand firm in God's grace? How, how do we keep from abandoning it, really? Yeah. That's a great question. And I appreciate you using that phrase. That comes from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12, Peter says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Hmm. I fear, Clay, that in my past, I knew Galatians 5.4. I knew Galatians 5.4 said that I could fall from grace. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time worrying about falling from grace. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, how far can I go before I fall? And I fear that an unhealthy fixation with falling from God's grace is what causes a lot of Christians to fall from God's grace. Okay. Too many of us know Galatians 5.4 and not enough of us know 1 Peter 5.12. This is the true grace of God. Stand 
firm in it. I'm reminded of a story. Mom had gone to bed, and she's lying asleep, and she's suddenly awakened by a loud thud on the floor above her and hearing her son's whimpering cries. And so she rushes upstairs. She sees him lying crumpled on the floor. She scoops him up. She sits on the bed. She's rocking him back and forth. He, he finally calms down, and just in very tender tone, she says, Oh, what happened, son? And he said, I must have stayed too close to where I got in. That's an eloquent kid. <laughs> eloquent kid, that's right. That's not a real story. Okay. <laughs> somebody, somebody made it up to illustrate this point. I think I stayed too close to where I got in. And that's the problem, I think, mm -hmm. for a lot of Christians, is that they're staying too close to where they got in. The best way to stand firm in God's grace is not try to stand at the edge of it, but to get smack in the middle of it. Like trying to stand on this table here. Right. It'd be, if, if I want to stand on the table, I probably shouldn't stand right here. Mm -hmm. I need to stand over there in, in the middle. middle. Right. I need to not stay too close to where I got in. It's like these folks who go to the canyons, go to the mm -hmm. Grand Canyon, and they're trying to peer out over and see how close to the edge they get. They fall in and they want to blame the canyon. No, it was because they tried to see how close they could get. And I fear that when all we think about is falling from God's grace, we spend all our time talking about how close we can get. And if that's what I'm going to focus on, I'm going to get too close and I'm going to abandon it and I'm going to fall. Right. And, and then we get into these debates and these arguments about, well, how much sinning am I allowed to do? And mm -hmm. what doctrines am I allowed to be wrong on? And, and how many times do I have to go to church to cover up for that? And that all stems from misunderstanding the definition of grace anyway. Right. Thinking that grace is God's prerogative to ignore our sins. And so we think, well, how much good things do I have? How many good things do I have to do? How much obedience? so that God will ignore these sins. Mm -hmm. And that's completely misunderstanding. When I realize that grace is God's power to overcome, I don't want to stand at the edge. I want to get thick in the middle of it because I don't want to sin. Yeah. So that's standing firm in it. Now, your question wasn't what does that mean, but how well, do we Well, no, do we it? need to define what it means. I've often termed it this way, draw near to God and you'll leave the line behind. Yeah. If, if we want to draw near the line, we'll get near it. Yes. If we want to be close to God, we'll leave the line behind. Absolutely. And not have these arguments about how much yeah. is too much. Okay, now we've defined standing firm. We're, we're going to be smack dab in the middle of God's grace. Now, yeah. Okay, now how do we do that? How much time do we have? we got enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, interestingly, my series, my sermon series on this okay. is an eight-part sermon series, and it's all called Standing Firm in God's Grace. All right, where can I, we find that? You can find it at brownsburgchurch.info. Brownsburg with Brownsburg a G? with a G, yeah. B R O W N S B U R G uh -huh. Church C H U R C H dot info. Brownsburg Church dot info. info. And you can go to the sermons page and you can okay. filter uh, but I, can we maybe we can put a link up in the notes, you think? Sure, we can, we'll do that. Okay. Like, we can do that. So I, we can set that up. But so I could preach you the whole eight ser sermons right now Just if you give want. Me the titles. <laughs> But there's actually eight lessons. We've already covered okay. some of the things that I share with that. If uh -huh. I want to stand firm in God's grace, number one, I got to know I need God's grace. Okay, got to need. I, I may not remember that. all eight titles. That's like trying to remember the seven dwarves. But I, I know I've got a Sleepy, need. Sleepy. <laughs> I, I I have to recognize my need. Okay, we got to recognize the need. I have to listen to God's word. Listen to His word. Okay. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing, hearing, hearing by, by the word, word of God. God. If right. faith is our access to God's grace, mm -hmm. I can only stand firm in God's grace by being in this. I can't do it by reading Chicken Soup for the Soul. I can't do it by uh, watching Dr. Phil. If I want to stand firm in God's grace, I've got to be in this. I have to hope fully in God's grace. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. It's good that we were able to redo this part of the video because I couldn't yep. remember the verse in the last right. one. You remember? <laughs> 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of okay. Jesus Christ. Somebody once asked me, are you saying that our hope is fully in God's grace? Well, that's what it says. I just say that's what Peter said. Okay. Peter says that's where my hope needs to fully be. Mm -hmm. And I think about what your investment advisor is going to tell you. He's going to tell you, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You need to diversify. Mm -hmm. What Peter says is, no, put all your eggs in one basket. Put all your eggs in the basket that I have to hope in God's grace. Okay. That when I stand before God in judgment, it's His grace that's going to save me. Now, the passage goes on to explain how I'm going to live when I'm hoping fully in God's grace. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that, oh, I just do what I want because I'm hoping in God's grace. It means that I surrender to God and live in holiness by the power of His grace. Gotcha. So I, I need to hope fully in God's grace. I need to surrender to God. Okay. 
I need to surrender to God. Surrendering to God is me cutting off myself. Rather than living where I want to live, I live where God wants me to live. Galatians 2.20. Yeah, I was just going to go yeah, turn it I over I have been there. crucified mm -hmm. with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Mm. If I want to stand firm in God's grace, I've got to learn to live by faith and not by law. Ooh. And I know that's a shocking statement. And let me clarify what I don't mean by that. What I don't mean by that is living by faith means I disregard God's law. Let's remember the entire basis for this is I want to keep God's law. Right. And God's grace is the power that allows me to do that. So when I say live by faith, not by law, I'm looking at Romans chapter 9. At the very end of Romans chapter 9 and then at the beginning of chapter 10, verse Romans 9, 30 through chapter 10 and verse 4, where it compares Israel with the Gentiles. And it, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Continuing in chapter 10, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I understand that Paul is talking here with the Israelites using as the illustration their relationship with the Old Covenant law, with the law of Moses. I get that, but I fear that sometimes what I do with Christ's law is I approach it in the exact same way that kept the Israelites from attaining righteousness. Because they approached it as if it was based on works. As if it was based on works. Now that doesn't mean that I'm allowed to disobey. i got to right. lay that groundwork again because this is so easy for folks to misquote and misunderstand. But what he says is, if, if I want the righteousness, I've got to pursue faith. Mm -hmm. What does living by faith mean? Living by faith does not mean, oh, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to say it, but now I'm just going to do what I want. Galatians 2.20 was mm -hmm. living by faith. Right. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Mm -hmm. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's living by faith. And what that says to me is that I'm having faith in Jesus' power to save, Jesus' power to help me overcome sin, Jesus, that, that Jesus' way works, that I'm doing this not as if it were based on works, not as if it were God gave me a law, and now when I keep that law well enough, I get to go to heaven. Right. But rather, I believe Jesus will save me, I believe Jesus' way works, I'm just going to do things His way. Mm -hmm. And what that allows for is when I mess up on keeping the, the legal requirements, I can keep coming back to Jesus because I believe in His power to save. Right. It doesn't mean when I mess up on the legal requirements, ah, who cares? That's, that's what God's grace is for. It doesn't mean that at all. So I've got to live by faith and not by law. The problem is, and the reason why I want to make, stress that point, is because I fear a lot of folks, when, when they have this idea of living by law, they, they end up having this idea that I'm kind of saving myself by, you know, it's my works. Mm -hmm. I, I approach it as if it were based on works. Now, I know there's a lot of questions about that, and I, and I hope that that's a clear well, We can't point. answer them all. Can't this, answer all the right. questions in this video, but I also hope that makes the clear point that I am not telling anyone. Mm -hmm. and I've never told anyone, and I would never tell anyone that you can go to heaven while disregarding God's will. Right. Never say that, and, and nothing I've ever taught has said that. Mm -hmm. But I am saying live by faith. Right. Not as if it were based on works, that I can keep the legal requirements and get myself into heaven that way. So I gotta live by faith, not by law. Okay. I have to give God the glory. Right. And what that means <clears throat> is that when it's all said and done, when Peter got back in the boat and he had actually been able to walk on the water, would he be able to say to the other disciples, Look at me. Mm. I walked on water. Even if he hadn't sunk. Even if he hadn't sunk. Okay. But he did get to walk on water. I think right. a lot of times we focus on the sinking That's and true. miss that That's he did true. actually walk on the water. Yep. It says he came to Jesus and we got near to Jesus. Uh, but with that, he wasn't able to say, look at me. Rather, mm -hmm. what he had to do was turn to Jesus and give him the glory. And I have no doubt that the disciples knew that Peter was walking on the water, and it wasn't because of Peter. It was because of Jesus. I have no doubt they knew that. Yeah. At the end of the day, okay. when I have walked on water, if you will, when I have overcome my sins, when I have lived by God's law, I don't get to get down in my prayers and get down on my knees in prayer and be like the Pharisee. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm so awesome that I do this and I do that. 
what I need to do is thank God mm -hmm. that He did that for me, that He did that in me. You know, my, the things that I did in obedience to God today, I don't get to give to Him as my gift. Hey, God, look what I did for you. Hmm. I need to glorify Him. Thank you for what you did for me. Right. It's like when David walked out onto the battlefield. Here's my question. That's true. Who, who picked the stones? David picked the stones. Okay. Who, uh, who threw the stones? Who threw the stones? Who slung the David, sling? Who aimed yeah. it? Who got yeah. the sword? Who chopped David, off the head? Let yeah. me ask you this. Who killed Goliath? Well, David killed Goliath, <laughs> but yeah. all through he says, the Lord, yeah. the Lord, and the Lord. Yeah, and when it's all said and done, David doesn't get to turn to God and say, look what I did for you. Right. He gets to say, thank you. Yes. And in fact, that I believe is what Psalm 8 is. Psalm 8 is David's thank you. Maybe not specifically for the slaying of Goliath, though many believe that this is in response to that. But he says, out of, verse 2 of Psalm 8, Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Mm -hmm. David is not saying, oh, look at the babies, how wonderful they are. They show us the working of God. David is saying, I'm the baby. Right. I'm the infant. Mm -hmm. when, when I have done anything that stills the foe or the avenger, it's actually God that's doing it. Right. So at the end of the day, I need to give God the glory. And then if I want to stand firm in God's grace, I need to pay it forward. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. I hope you're not going to ask me to review all of those. No, I'm not even sure no, if I got good. all of them. We won't but review I need, that. I need to pay it forward. And what that means is I think about Matthew 18 with the unforgiving servant mm. who the king had forgiven him something like 200,000 years of daily wages. Right. And you would think that having received that kind of grace would have changed him. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. He turned around and found someone who owed him something like 50 days, I think it was. And instead of being able to pay that grace forward, demanded the payment and then threw him into debtor's prison. Right. And so I need to pay God's grace forward. I need to... God has given me his blessing so I can be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. If I want to stand firm in God's grace, I've got to pass that grace on. Right. right. That's standing firm in God's grace. Okay. One last question. We, we've talked about a lot of things, but how do we grow in God's grace? Uh, to use another Peter term, right. uh, how, how do we, uh, we recognize the value of it, how we access it, the fact that we can abandon it, or the fact that we need to, to continue in it and be firm in it, uh, but how, how do we continue to grow in God's grace? Second Peter 3.18 okay. is what you're thinking about there. Right. Where Peter, at the end of that book, said, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a tough question. It was a tough question for me as I was studying God's grace to try to figure it out because back when I kind of tacitly viewed God's grace as His ignoring of my sin, mm -hmm. when I heard growing in grace, that sounded to me like I'm sinning more and more because... Well, if grace is him ignoring my sins right. and that grace is increasing, that must mean he has to ignore more and more sins. Okay. And I'm thinking that as a Christian, I should be sinning less and less, not more and more. So I should be decreasing in God's grace. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't need it as much. Well, if I think that it's ignoring sin, that's true, but that's not what it is. God's grace is his power to overcome. And so growing in grace means I am deepening my dependence okay. upon God's power. As I am a Christian longer and longer, having witnessed God's working in my life, and being able to say, and having given God the glory, mm -hmm. having said, hey, I was victorious today, and the reason God is because your grace was sufficient. Having gone through that another day and another day and another day, today I am even more convinced to depend on Him. And who was it that wrote this? This is Peter that Peter. wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, you have little faith. Yeah. Uh, he's gaining faith. Right. And so he understood that concept of needing to depend on God to overcome his sins. Mm -hmm. As I'm a Christian longer and longer, I'm depending more and more on him. That means my life is surrendered more and more to him, which does mean I will be sinning less and less. I'll be becoming more like Jesus. Okay. And that's the goal, to be more like Jesus. Yeah, to be more like Jesus. So There's growing, a song that we even sing. More like you. Yeah. Growing in God's grace okay. means deepening my dependence upon His grace. And so, if as I grow in Christ, I begin to think, oh, I've got this licked, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Now I've abandoned His grace again. I, I think about carrying the cross, okay. carrying the cross daily, picking up the cross. If there's ever a time when I think, hey, you know what, I've licked all this, I've got it beat, I can overcome sin, and I set my cross down, mm -hmm. I'm going to go right back. You know, it's like 
It's like that, that sinful part of me hasn't abandoned. It's just over in the corner doing push-ups, waiting for that day when I put the cross down. And, of course, when that happens, what I can do is I can do exactly what Peter did in Matthew 14. Lord, save me. Right. And I come back. But growing in grace means deepening my dependence upon God. Okay. Let, let's review this all one more time. <laughs> Define grace. Grace is not God's prerogative to overlook our sins. It's okay. not God's willingness to ignore our sins. It is not God's permission to sin. Okay. It is God's power to overcome sin. Why do we need it? Because we're sinners. And we sinned and gave power to sin in our lives. And the only way to get rid of that, we can't break that power by our power. It's only by God's power. So we need His grace to do that. How do we access it? Through faith. Because faith is what causes us to work God's way. Mm -hmm. Because we believe God's way works. Okay. What does it do for us now? Or do we have access to it now? Yeah, we have access to it now. Certainly, grace was administered in the cross. And we will receive grace in the end. But... If grace is God's power to overcome sin, it's acting in our lives right now. It's training us right now to overcome sin. And we can turn to the throne of grace for help in our time of need right now. Okay. Now, I said, can we lose it? But you said no. <laughs> so can, can we abandon God's we grace? We can abandon God's grace. If we leave our faith in Jesus Christ, putting our faith in ourselves, or just saying that there's nothing, or just going back to the world, abandoning what he said, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If I right. decide, well, I'm going to try to get to God some other way than what's revealed here, I've abandoned my faith, and I've abandoned the grace of God. And so instead of abandoning it, then we want to stand, stand firm, firm in, in it. it. Okay. And we stand firm in it by doing those several things we talked about a few yeah, minutes ago. Yeah, those eight things there. <laughs> and I then, think we got and they continue to grow. And we want and, to grow in it. We want okay. to deepen our dependence upon God. Any last words you want to give to the audience uh, before we press the off button? <laughs> right. Make sure the light's still yeah. on here, that yeah. the battery hadn't died again. <laughs> I think God's grace is absolutely important, and that, that's an understatement. I sound almost silly saying yeah. that, but the reason why I recognize its importance more now is that shift from believing that God is ignoring mm -hmm. sins to God is giving strength to overcome. My understanding of God's grace is helping me now because what I recognize is that when I mess up, I don't have to give up. When I mess up, I can turn to Jesus and cry out, Lord, save me. And he will. And I, I think about what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This passage says the reason I can work out my salvation is because God is working in me. And that, Clay, mm -hmm. is God's grace. That working in me, that okay. is God's grace. That's powerful. A lot of folks are afraid of this passage because they're afraid that if we rely too much on verse 12, we'll, or excuse me, verse 13, that we'll quit working mm -hmm. on our salvation. But what Paul recognized is because God is working in me, that's what gives any work I do any effectiveness. And what I have become very confident and comfortable in is knowing that God's grace is active and alive in me, that God is working in me. Mm -hmm. And because He is working in me, I can keep working working. If it weren't for His grace, there'd be no point in my working. My working would accomplish nothing. And so I'm going to work on my salvation today because I believe God is working. And if I mess up, I'm going to come back to working because I believe God is working. And I don't have to give it up. And I don't have to abandon it. I don't have to end in despair. I can keep hanging on. And now because I understand God's grace, I know I can make it. And I know you can too. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate those words of encouragement there. Okay. Yeah, because I believe you can, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that, that this d discussion uh, has been beneficial to you. It's helped build your faith uh, to trust in the grace of God that has been given to all those who come to Him in faith. We're sorry for the technical interruption there uh, about halfway through that video. Uh, I hope that all this will come out well. Uh, you can email Edwin at edwin at edwincrozier.com. Right. You want to spell Crozier for us? C-R-O-Z-I-E-R. -E and uh, he'd be there. Very happy to field any questions that you might have. Uh, 
He has several books that are available for a deeper Bible study. Several websites, edwincrozier.com or God, God's Way. Is that one? Either, either one can get you there. Okay. Godswayworks.com or edwincrozier.com will get you to the same website. Giveattentionreading.com is another one of Edwin's really great sites for uh, Bible study and videos as well. I would just end with the words of Paul and Barnabas as they were leaving Antioch of Pisidia in Acts chapter 13 where they urged the people to continue in God's grace. Until next time, my friends, keep the faith. Bye. So what do you don't like about chicken soup for the soul? <laughs>